Poetic, subtly layered, and politically engaged, her work advances the exploration of forgotten histories, multi-generational memory, landscape, and the Japanese American experience. She is a recipient of a 2020 Leeway Transformation Award and a current recipient of an Independence Public Media Foundation Projects Grant. Prior to this, she has received support from a Pew Artist Fellowship, a Rockefeller in Intercultural Media Fellowship, and NEA Visual Arts Fellowship, as well as grants from ITVS, the New York Foundation for the Arts, NYSCA, and a Temple University VP Arts Award. In 2019, Tajiri received a Fogo Island Arts Residency, and in 2018, a residency at Banff Center for the Arts. Currently, she's an associate professor in the film media arts department at Temple University, where she teaches documentary production. And now she's on summer break and just working on all of her many projects. So it's really exciting to have you join us. Thank you, Jill, uh, for inviting me. And uh, thank you to Kathy and everybody at JC. And um, it's really nice to be with a Nikkei audience. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't happen too often out here and not often enough. So um, it's, a, it's an honor. Thank yeah. you. One of the benefits of um, being able to Zoom has yeah. allowed us to connect with filmmakers from Japan and New York. And mm. it's just really um, broadened our connections. And you know, yeah. it's been great. So I'd love to hear about um, where your interest in filmmaking began. Mm -hmm and kind of how that evolved. You studied studio art. And mm -hmm. So what was the focus there? And then how did film take care? Yeah, <laughs> so, um, well, my in my family, both my parents were uh, storytellers, interestingly enough. I mean, they just, they were very uh, anecdotal. They, they both were kind of colorful characters. And my father in particular, you know, he um, had, you know, really gone through a lot in his life, um, kind of survived poverty and was always kind of, you know, figuring things out. He actually um, uh, spent a lot of time in his early adulthood. He, he wrote for the Nietzsche Bay. So he was in San Francisco, um, but um, neither of my parents went to college. And then, and uh, so they kind of like, I don't know, they encouraged us to go into the arts, but filmmaking in particular, I didn't necessarily start out and I, I kind of didn't think I could do it. I mean, when I was, there weren't very many filmmakers, women filmmakers, and there weren't very many in the, in the filmmaking department at CalArts, but um, it was something in the back of my mind that I wanted to do. And then finally, I just kind of stepped into it and, and kind of went for it. Um, but yeah, and, and the other thing is that I think my father had this particular uh, obsession with hidden histories and untold stories, you know, things that kind of got hidden. And that's been kind of my obsession, you know, kind of excavating these um, lost or covered up histories. Yeah. So what was like your very first film? Um, well, I made video art to begin with. So I made this um, kind of, you know, conceptual art piece that had text and image because the, and someone just asked uh, what years I was at KellArts. So I was at KellArts from 77 to 82. Um, I got my BFA and my MFA there. Um, and so, yeah, the first film I made was a short video art piece. Um, it had a lot, the eighties were in the art world were a lot about like superimposing text on image to kind of, um, I guess, give a double reading, right? To layer things and to question how information, how we were getting information and um, what kinds of um, things we were taking for granted in, in like, you know, being consumers of images and Hollywood media. So the text was a way to kind of um, sort of intervene between the viewer looking at things and interrupt and, uh, you know, be critical of the, of, you know, imagery, commercial imagery. So that's kind of how, where I started, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. Wow. Well, we see definitely see a lot of layering of photos and text and um, sound in your filmmaking. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about Passion for Justice now, and then mm -hmm. you know, of course, we'll 
visited again with the Kochiyamas, but I'm wondering how that project evolved. Sure. You can kind of set that up. Yeah, so um, I was actually um, making another film, which was about uh, my family's experience in, in the concentration camps. And I had gone to the National Archives and was doing a lot of research and found a lot of records and photos. And while I was there, I heard that there was a, a workshop being given by a woman who was a really uh, renowned researcher. So I took the workshop and then um, somehow during the intermission, I met this woman named Pat Saunders mm -hmm. and we got to talking and she said, do you know Yuri Kochiyama? And I said, well, actually I do because I'd met Yuri through my cousins. And um, it also turned out that when I did meet Yuri and it was in the eighties after I moved to New York, um, Yuri had actually um, shared, uh, or she had lived in a rooming house in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, that my parents also lived in. It was a converted funeral parlor. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I guess there was a housing shortage, right? So she was on one side of, you know, and then my parents were on the other side. And then I think they had to share the bathroom in between. And it was like a boarding house, you know? And so she, that's how she knew my parents. And she kind of, you know, didn't, had never met me, but she kind of knew of my parents and my family. But um, so, you know, one of the things that Pat said was I always wanted to document Yuri's life and her work. And um, but I just knew Yuri as a more like from the Asian American side. And then she, Pat, who's, you know, who's African-American, knew Yuri more from the, you know, core and Malcolm X side. So it was really interesting kind of like, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this woman is really <laughs> I mean, Pat was aware, more aware than I was so. Um, and Pat had been also um, a, a political activist in the, starting in the early 60s and had attended the Audubon ballroom um, talks from Malcolm X. Um, she was a member of CORE, um, had um, you know, gone to Macomb to, to you know, work for the voter registration. So she was a pretty active um, yeah, person. And so it was interesting to kind of you know, have, have these conversations Mm -hmm. So basically, it's uh, we approached um, Aichi, and who is Yuri's other daughter, um, and uh, she was able to talk to Yuri and convince her that it was time. And um, we started out as an oral history project for about a year. We went over to the Kochiyamas and we taped, uh, you know, kind of chronologically Yuri telling her story, and um, and then eventually we segued into video. So, mm -hmm. wow. Well, the film is amazing, and we'll talk more about it, but just how relevant it is today. Yes. Ranga film. So congratulations. It's Thank kind you. of stood the test of time, and, yeah. you know, it's very powerful. Well, that was, Yuri was very powerful. She always she left an impression. Yes. You know, so committed and um, inspiring. So, yeah, congratulations on that film. So was Pat also a filmmaker or was she more of a oral Pat, historian? Well, isn't she, Pat was a very interesting one. Unfortunately, Pat passed away in 2015, so she's no longer with us, but I think she would be incredibly happy and overjoyed because um, I think this was really her dream was for the film to really be used in you know various community settings, to, to screen on public television, to be used as an organizing tool, to educate, you know, so. The film is really, it's interesting because it was kind of like dormant for so many years. Nobody would sort of screen it for a while. And now, you know, it's really, of course, right now it's very relevant. So it's really kind of interesting. It's having a rebirth, which mm -hmm. is great. Yeah. yeah. But Pat was a nurse, actually, who, who wanted to, I, I think, you know, she had been an organizer, became a nurse and wanted to go back, want, you know, really saw the effectiveness of film and, and how it could, um, you know, convey political messages and educate people and inspire people. So she saw the potential there and was learning filmmaking. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, what a great partnership that was. Right? Yeah. And what an important legacy this film yes. is. So, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about, you started to talk about the layering of film, at, um, text and film and visuals um, yes and that's very um present in in your filmmaking mm -hmm. so um there are a number of different films you can talk about um sure. i thought um i'd love to share with the audience if they don't know about history and memory for akiko and takashige 
Um, and that is available on Canopy. And a lot of our uh, regulars at Movie Night know how to access Canopy. Okay. So, um, so that's great. And um, we can also put a link to the trailer so people can preview it. Um, but can you um, talk a little bit about that film? Yeah, so um, that film came about through, um, you know, the period of the late 80s um, and, um, you know, the passing of the reparations and during that whole period. Um, and I, I, you know, actually in a funny way, Yuri was sort of an inspiration because she um, had, she came down to see some of my earlier video artwork at, at a venue in, um, I guess, in, uh, in, in Soho and um, yeah. York, she was pretty excited and very supportive. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she was sort of puzzled by it because some of that work was more abstract. It was very heady, very intellectual. And um, it made me reflect and stop for a second and think about, you know, what, what you know, uh, you know, what could I do? What, what, you know, I think she was inspiring me more to think about my own background. And I think also with the reparations, um, you know, being, being passed, I decided that I wanted to do um, something that was both um, reflected some of my family's um, stories and some of the stories like my father that we talked about hidden history with my father would talk about the family house that had been stolen, right, during the war. And um, so I, I, I set about researching and collecting materials um, because part of my project what is to take existing materials and to kind of um, unwrap them or unpack them and analyze them. And so that's kind of how that, that film came about. I decided to interview my family um, and um, I, I really had never really confronted or asked them. My mother was very, very um, amnesic about the whole thing. She just buried it. Um, my aunts were more open about it and, and very active in terms of thinking about it, but she, you know, really didn't want to talk about it. So part of the film, the process was to kind of get her to open up and tell the story. Yeah. 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 Well, it's great. You know, I, I love the film, um, listening to the audio it's you know so familiar to me the little pieces of story that I've heard washing dishes with my aunt you know, yes pieces here and there and my mom's sort of oh I don't know I don't remember mm -hmm. you know kind of that amnesia as you call it and mm -hmm. yeah and that was such a um, important time the 80s with the commission hearings and for the yes. first time people were um, asked to really beg yeah to share their story and they started to see other people um, being willing to do that. So it kind of right. gave them permission to, yes. um, yeah. So it was a really important time. And yeah, thank you for the, the film and the, mm -hmm. um, all the imagery too and the photos, that was really great. And you've la layered some like clips from films and yeah, Hollywood films. Yeah. 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 Is that a hard thing to get permission to utilize? And <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, at the time, I think in video art at that moment, I think uh, we were into stealing a lot of Hollywood films because of the the model that you know the um, the kind of. Um, I guess it was a guerrilla tactic, right? It was the model is, is that, that it's corporatized, right? And so um, there was a bit of, you know, video art sort of stealing, but also under fair use, we are being critical. We are commenting on, on these um, existing um, pieces, right? So it, it was in the copyright law, there is, a, there's a, there is a clause for fair use, meaning that if you are critical, you're commenting on something for educational reasons, then you can do that without necessarily licensing. Mm -hmm. It's a gray area, but I did get away with it for that point. And I think it, you know, I think it is really about being, you know, it's looking at the racism in Hollywood, right? Mm -hmm. or in these different, you know, um, media, um, corporate media um, films and productions. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I was, um, 
I'm not familiar with this film, but um, there is a film called Off Limits, and it sounds like you did a similar thing there. Yeah, um, well, that was a, an experimental piece, and that was a film about, um, basically a film that was made about, um, as if, you know, in this era of sort of uh, looking at the Vietnam War, it was a, a, a series of uh, films, Full Metal Jacket was one, um, Born the Fourth of July, they were all looking at sort of, you know, the U.S. perspective of the war and trying to reconcile, you know, all of the, the things that had happened there in, in terms of the U.S. imperialism in, in Vietnam. And, and so um, that particular film was, was very racist. And so I wanted to kind of layer two films together. I, you know, it was a film made in 89, about 68. And then I took a film that was made in 68 and I just kind of combined the soundtrack for one, just took it verbatim, just layered the soundtrack and then took um, a, a, a scene from the Off Limits film. And I um, told the perspective of a character who was a background character, who was a Vietnamese character, a, a background character describing what happened as a result of these two US um, agents in um, basically he gets killed. And so he described his own death, but in the background, you hear this 1968 film from um, Easy Rider. So it's kind of about the, the collision between these two things mm -hmm. um, and, and commenting on, you know, the kind of racism, I guess, in the Off Limits film. Wow, that's great. Um, let's see, I am going to give people a little bit more background on um, some of your other work. Um, we talked a little bit about, um, well, I wanna let people know, you know, how accomplished you are as a filmmaker. Um, so Rhea won the International Documentary Distinguished Achievement Award for History and Memory. And her feature film, Strawberry Fields, won the grand prize at the Fukuoka Asian International Film Festival. So I thought that was really great. And you mentioned that Strawberry Fields, you'll give us a link if we want to watch that because that one's kind of hard to find. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about Strawberry Fields and how the narrative, how you worked on that? Um, yeah, that film is a coming of age story and it has to do with uh, uh, a teen who's growing up in Chicago and um, She's, um, you know, I think uh, sensing that her family has has something that they're not they're not able to talk about. There is a lot of trauma, although she, I don't think she calls it trauma. She just knows that there's this unhappiness, um, and the frustration mounts. Um, at, at the beginning of the film, she loses her sister, um, and um, she's pretty unhappy as she decides to run away from home. Um, the ghost of her sister um, appears to her, is kind of like a trickster figure, kind of accompanies her, guides her, and she goes on a road trip. They go end up in Poston, um, and um, she um, has a revelation there. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's a feature film. Mm -hmm. The writer, Carrie Sakamoto, wrote the script. She's a Canadian, Japanese-Canadian um, novelist, wrote the script. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. And then that was um, shown on um, public television. Is that? It was. Um, it was funded by public television. Um, they never actually aired it. Um, oh but, <laughs> but it did have a feature theatrical, small theatrical uh -huh. uh, distribution. Yeah. So. Okay. And I and I noticed that kind of like spirits of the past or ghosts mm -hmm. um, also appear in some of your your other films as a, a character, right? Mm -hmm. Strong character. Um, can you tell us about your um, kind of feature length film, Lordville? And you mm -hmm. got a lot of accolades for that film, but it's very personal to you as well, right? The sense of place. Um, yeah, so that was it. Lordville is a film about um, a town in upstate New York. It's near the Delaware River. And um, I actually, uh, well, it came about because um, I actually bought a, a piece of property in Lordville and um, I had never really owned property before. And it, I guess when I was handed the deed and it was ironic, it was on Thanksgiving day. For some reason we had to do the closing on Thanksgiving. I forget the reason why, 
but um, it came with a, um, a, a map that was a surveyor's map. And I decided um, to, and, and also it came with the original uh, chain of deeds that went all the way back to 1863. Um, and so I was really, I don't know, I was really sort of haunted by the idea of like property and lineage and then indigeneity, right? Like, you know, obviously everything goes back to, you know, if this is the marker 1863 to, um, you know, sort of colonial, you know, uh, settler colonialism, then what, you know, what was before this, that's not really written down, right? So I, I took that map and I actually did a ritual where I, I just followed the map. I walked the contours of that property line and tried to just meditate on what it meant to like, you know, here's the line, I own this on one side, I don't own this on the other side. What does that mean? It seemed really meaningless. Um, so it made me want to dig into the records and I ended up finding a genealogist who's a Native American genealogist who actually traced the line, the line her lineage back uh, to um, a woman named Batia Van Dunk, who married the original founder of Lord Bell. And that went back to, I forget now, um, 1830 or 1840, something like that. And, and that's kind of, I kind of um, went through and, and talked to all the people in the town and kind of made a film um, that is both about like walking the landscape and then interspersed with interviews. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's great. Um, we're going to show um, one of your, ex I guess, um, what do we call it? Like an installation, multimedia mm -hmm. installation. Um, so we're going to share that. And it um, is about kind of the resettlement period in Pennsylvania. And um, can you give a little setup for that? And we'll watch it and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. So. Um... In Philadelphia, we have, um, so I live in Philadelphia, by the way, I don't, I, I think uh, Kathy said I live in New York. I used to live in New York. I actually live in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Um, and I teach at Temple. But um, Asian Arts Initiative, which is a media uh, and arts organization, was having their 25th anniversary, and they wanted to do a set of commissioned projects. And um, the theme was, um, uh, what is it, was it called? Um, history, uh, wasn't history and memory, but it was history in place and, you know, thinking about history in place. And so I started thinking, well, I wonder what the history of Japanese Americans have been in Philadelphia. I just never, you know, just something I never asked and never thought about. So I went about instead of do, doing research and I first came across this character, this man named Tatsui Baba, who was a really interesting political figure from Japan who came and settled in Philadelphia in the late 1890s. Um, he was here for two years, he died here. He's, he's, he has a tombstone in a very famous cemetery, the Woodland Cemetery, which has a lot of all of the famous big families of Philadelphia. And here is Tatsui Baba, who is that? You know, just And I dug into his history, he was a bit of a, a political dissident in Japan, uh, was, was arrested for explosives. He'd been uh, educated in um, England. So that was one of my sites was his grave, you know. And then I went up to the resettlement period and found out that there, like really within five minutes from my where I was living at the time, um, there was a boarding house um, that, that was uh, uh, run by a Japanese, a, a Nisei couple, um, the Inoues. And they, that was where um, the WRA was sending everybody when they were resettling after the war. And, and so um, that was now a strip mall with Joe Coffee. And that right where their house stood was Joe Coffee, where I used to go get my coffee. So funny. So it made me think about, you know, how we have these erasures, right, of, of very prominent histories. And Japanese American history is so obscure in Philadelphia. So I really wanted to find a way to commemorate these sites. And so that's kind of what I did. I went to, and then one of the sites is uh, a shop. I knew that this one strip of, it's called Lancaster Avenue and has all these beautiful old storefronts. I knew that someone had said there was a Japanese American storefront there, but nobody could tell me where it was. I couldn't find it. So I decided to create one as sort of a speculative, right? It's a speculating on, because when we can't really get to the truth, 
sometimes we just want to put a marker there, right? To commemorate something that we can't really find, but we know something would happen there. So that's kind of what I did. I um, found a, a, someone who was willing to lend me their storefront and I uh, at night projected something. You'll see it's pretty much explained. So I don't want to go on and on talking about it. You can just watch it because I have a documentation video, which you'll share. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Because my fingernails are dyed with the pigment from balsam flowers, my heart is dyed with the teachings of my parents. The dull one may be able to count the galaxies in the sky, the teachings of my parents cannot. Just as the ships that run in the night are guided to safety by the North Star, I am guided by my parents who birthed me and watch over me. Just as there is no point in owning splendid jewelry if you will not maintain it, human beings who maintain their body minds will live life wonderfully. Those are those we live sincerely, we always come true and they prosper. You can do anything if you try, but you cannot if you do not. You can do anything if you try, but you cannot if you do not. see that um, there is a uh, 
uh, John, John Punabiki, Punabiki. Yeah, who, uh, he's question. asking about your family. Yeah, so it's so funny because I thought there's going to be somebody here who, who knows my family right. <laughs> because it's the West Coast and the East Coast, nobody knows my family, but um, certainly in the San Francisco Bay Area, people know my family. So yeah, my, um, my father, um, my father was a photographer and he was, uh, he actually was given uh, a camera uh, by his older brother, Larry. And Larry Tajiri um, was a journalist for uh, the Pacific Citizen and um, later on was a, a theater, theater, uh, theater critic in the Denver Post. And uh, my father, yeah, my father became the picture editor at, at Playboy. And um, and Larry's wife, Guyo, I guess that's your uncle and aunt. Okay, so we're related. Um, Guyo and, and Larry, yeah, they had a, well, Guyo, unfortunately, Larry passed away when he was about 50, but Guyo lived in the, in the, at Berkeley um, in this beautiful A-frame house. So I used to love go visiting, visiting um, sometimes. Um, and my uncle, yes, my uncle Shinkichi is a sculptor. So definitely, I think having arts in the family was really uh, key yeah, because um, Shinkichi was an artist and I used to get his announcements and I was thinking, wow, what an interesting life. <laughs> and so I, you know, it was kind of a dream. And um, my father, you know, my both my parents are very supportive. So it was really nice. Um, they, they did think it was a viable thing to become an artist, although they did tell me I needed to <laughs> get some business skills. Um, <laughs> they said, oh, but it's really hard. You'll, you'll uh, you know, it's hard to make money, but, you know, but it's, it's, it's a worthy, you know, kind of uh, line of work, I guess. Right. So, yeah. That's great. And, you know, John actually is a retired, recently retired journalist. Well, John, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to meet you. But yeah. I, yeah. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Sorry. Oh, we, there you are. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, did, oh, it had not John. occurred to me. It had not occurred to me until I heard you talking that we are you know, somewhat related. So yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> I think I, I think I heard about you because everyone used to say that there was a nephew of Guyo's, and uh, he must be that person. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, nice. Oh, I'm glad I got to meet you. So you might have met Yoshiko, my my uh, aunt Yoshiko at some point. I don't know. But, she, no. she would talk about you sometimes. I think she said, "Well, she knew about you anyway." Yeah. yeah. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> we'll have to have a family reunion. Yeah, yeah. I have to. You have to leave me your email address with with uh, Jill so I can get in touch with you. Okay. Yeah. I'll let you get back to your talk. Okay. Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> Thanks, John. Well, I loved the um, um, Watari Dori um, thank you. birds of passage and. Um, you know, I worked on a project called California's Japan Towns, and we researched all the pre-world, not all, mm. but many pre-World War II um, Japanese or Japanese American communities. And mm. a lot of it is erased, like you said, and, mm -hmm. you know, and the memory is just in the archives, right? Or in the in the memories of the people. So mm -hmm. we met a lot of people um, who shared stories mm -hmm. and tried to see what buildings still existed. Yeah. Like you said, there are many, many layers um, mm -hmm. of history that, you know, kind of gets um, buried under. Um, yeah. So thank you for um, sharing the Philadelphia sure. story. And <laughs> how long was that installation up? And then how did, you know, yeah. the response and Oh, it wasn't up long enough. It was only up for a month. I felt like it needed to be up longer, but um, it was, you know, the funding and everything and the arrangements. I mean, it, you know, just to get the permission to put something somewhere and keep it there, you know, um, it, it's it's tricky. But um, the reaction was, you know, very positive. I mean, um, the family, the Inouye grandchildren came and they loved it. Um, people were surprised that the one, the, the installation at the house 
is on a really main pathway. A lot of people were going by there um, their way, on their way to work, on their way home from work. People would stop by. They would, you know, read about it. Um, they picked up a pamphlet. They read about it. So it was, um, you know, it was a very, uh, or, or the other one was the bicycle in front of the, the uh, cemetery was at bus stop. And so people were very curious, what is this bicycle? Why is it here? Why is it blue? And, you know, and then they would kind of find out more about it, you know, but that was kind of the, the idea was to sort of put something there, a mysterious object that people would want to, you know, be gravitated, gravitate towards and then want to find out about it mm -hmm. and then, you know, find out this larger history. So. so tell us again about the symbolism of the bicycle and then the um, wagon. Yeah, so um, the bicycle, so Miko Horikawa is a, somebody, a, a, a Nisei woman who um, was pretty active in the community. And uh, her family actually ended up in, in um, Seabrook Farms, which was the um, uh, uh, bird's eye plant where a lot of Nisei got hired to, to live and work in that factory, right, uh, for frozen foods. And in a way, it was a sort of a funny situation where I think that, you know, it was kind of they were there, but, you know, you could sort of couldn't afford to leave because your wages would just pay for your rent almost. But so it was a very tight knit community and they eventually organized and, um, you know, were given uh, fair wages. But um, she said that she she had wanted a bicycle in camp and of course she couldn't get one. And when they were there, they they bought a bicycle and she learned how to ride it. But then everybody wanted, you know, did not not everybody had a bicycle. Everyone wanted to learn, so they all, all learned how to ride on her bicycle. They shared this bicycle, and uh, I love that story. And I decided to just kind of uh, make have a, a bicycle like that, and that would be a symbol of that kind of community sharing, and leave it at different places at the different sites, so you could know that that was the site for one of the sites for the the project. And the wagon was, um, so, um, 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 I'm forgetting, is it Bill Horikawa? So it's her husband. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, sometimes I forget names late at night. Yeah. Um, but he shared his story, which was before he went to Poston, he had to give up his red, his prized red, red wagon, and he couldn't take it with him. And um, my idea was to kind of create this, haunted landscape that would kind of take over the shop at night so that shop is haunted and at night you would see the post and that's a was a still a post and you would see post and you would see this mysterious red wagon that would kind of come and kind of take over this landscape and and um, kind of haunt you and the bicycle would be there and these two objects that carried a lot of significance for people somehow had their own life you know as these kind of ghosts their own yeah that's great Thank you. Um, I know you peeked a little bit at JSA's website and you know um, just an outline of the work that we do. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Wow, congratulations. That's so, fantastic. Yeah, 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 it's really great. Um, it evolved um, from students at Cal um, in the early 70s who decided or kind of responded to a need of their grandparents who were Issei, Japanese speaking, elderly, um, and they were wanting to um, make sure that social services or that services were available that mm -hmm. were culturally sensitive and that, you know, language was an issue so that they could um, provide a vehicle so that they can um, be supported. And, you know, kind of started with the lunch program and went on from there, went to housing, et cetera. But um, so very near and dear to our mission is our elder, our elders and our seniors and aging. And I love um, the um, clip of your current project, Wisdom Gone Wild. And I wonder if you could tell us about that project yeah. and where you are in that. And mm -hmm. So um, this was a film, this is a film about, uh, I tried to, well, uh, my mother developed dementia in 1999, she passed away in 2015. So she had a you know, very long um, run with, you know, the last 16 years of her life having dementia. And I was her caregiver. I was long distance, um, 
but I spend a lot of time going back and forth. Um, my, my siblings were, were somewhat involved. My sister lived in a different city. My brother was, you know, very busy working, but, um, you know, at different moments, I kind of filmed things and just, but it was really just for the family. But I, I decided in, um, a few years before she passed away, that this would, it might be good to share this experience because uh, as I was getting more um, uh, skilled, I guess, at, at, at caregiving, I, I had a lot of insights and I thought it would be good to share them with other people. And um, one of them is that, um, you know, um, when people develop dementia, um, that there, there still is a core of them that remains. It's just that their wisdom has gone wild. And that, and by that, they, they kind of enter a different state that can be very, you know, that you can engage with and you can find a way in and connect with. And you kind of have to take the um, approach that you're entering their house and that you're entering their world. And um, it's, it's a different world maybe, but it's, it's still very relevant and has its own, you know, if you listen carefully, you can actually follow the logic. And so that's kind of how it went with my mom. So this little clip was a, just a special day. We, she liked to go to the museum um, before she developed dementia. And then afterwards I found, and this has actually been proven through a lot of research that bringing elderly people who have dementia to um, museums activates, just like music, activates a certain part of their brain and can make them very lively, engaged. Um, so... Yeah, so this was a particular, well, this kind of demonstrates that, so, yeah. Okay, Kathy, can we show the clip? Over the next three years, I decided to try things to engage Rose's crazy wisdom. Our small outings became forays into adventure. I entered her house as a guest, and time and space expanded. Romani! Romani! Oh boy! <laughs> Where's mommy? Uh, where's mommy? For their mother. They're not. Oh. <laughs> they are not looking for their mothers. They're having fun. Oh, it's so wonderful. So, are you in post production, Rhea, with the film? Yes, I'm editing it. Um, it's a it's a kind of a difficult film for personal reasons, but also it's a it's comprised of a lot of fragments, and so it's kind of trying to find the logic within that that uh, structure and yeah but we're, we're we have to finish it by the end of the year <laughs> so yeah yeah 
Well, we'd love to um, share it when when it's finished. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. It would You're love getting a lot of comments. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, yeah, she did identify with the children. And she had a lot of interesting um, throughout dementia and because she was you know being taken care of rather than being the one who takes care of other people she had a lot of things about moms and she would always say are you the mama are you the mama you know wait who's the mama here you know it was kind of funny i i i appreciated that a lot and yeah to think about that even the concept of what it means to mother right to be a mother something that we maybe we don't always value enough you know and um so it, it really called a lot of attention to that and somebody asked um, about um, the Gagaku, Gagaku music. Um, it was just that I, I wanted to create this um, kind of a landscape at night. Um, and I wanted the objects to be very um, ceremonial that in, and have a procession, a processional with these objects that really would be considered very mundane, ordinary objects, but I wanted them to have a very special uh, elevated um, kind of importance. And so they had that processional and then the, the, the wagon actually flies, <laughs> flies up into the, yeah. So that's why that was there. Um, so, yeah, if anyone has any other uh, questions or comments for Ria, now would be a good time. Um, and while we're sort of waiting for that, um, we're going to watch um, Passion for Justice in a little bit, and we're going to speak with uh, Kotiyamas. I think you spoke to already um, your relationship with the Kotiyamas, kind of the families, right? The two families. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, the there's more interest in the film today and that Pat would be proud. And yeah, so that's really, really great. Do you have other um, thoughts um, for us as we kind of move into the next part of our program? Um, I think uh, we, well, you know, Adi and I were just mentioning just how uh, timely you know, it's almost prophetic, like to kind of pick up this film again and, and watch it. Um, I myself hadn't seen it, you know, uh, for a while. Um, and part of it was because of the format changes. And then, you know, I stopped buying DVD players and they don't, the computers don't have them anymore. And so it was really odd. I was in this odd place where I couldn't watch it for a period of time. And then, um, you know, I, was getting streaming copy. I finally got a streaming link a few years ago from my distributor, but I was really surprised. And then just recently, of course, in the last year, um, people had been requesting it. And I, you know, sat down again and, and watched it. And it was really, I was actually very happy that it just seemed to cover a, a, a lot, you know, everything is kind of very quick because it was supposed to fit an hour, but I just was really encompassed um, her life's work to that point. So, um, and um, just how timely your thinking is. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, um, I don't see any other comments, but I know, Ria, thank you so much for um, joining us. I know. Yes. Day, tomorrow, and, <laughs> you know, busy summer. It uh, finishing yeah. films and <laughs> yes, but um, yeah, it's really it was really a pleasure to to join um, everybody here with JC and um, this audience. So mm -hmm. thank you everybody also for for turning out tonight, and I hope you enjoy the film. And um, the Kuchiyama uh, Audi and Akemi will um, really be very interesting. We I I've interacted with them and done a few screenings with them in the last month and it's going to be pretty interesting talking to them so I think right. that'll be really fun yeah. yeah thank you everybody well we'd love uh, to have you again so okay i will come back okay. gladly great all right take care thank everyone thank you ria so much you're welcome thank you thank you again take care everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye read a quick bio just um, to officially or properly introduce you. 
Aikemi Kochiyama is a scholar, activist, and community builder who currently serves as the Director of Advancement at Manhattan Country School. She is also co-director of the Yuri Kochiyama Archives Project and co-editor of Passing It On, a memoir by Yuri Kochiyama. A graduate of Spelman College, Akemi is a doctoral candidate in the PhD program in cultural anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. So welcome, Akemi. Thanks for joining. Thank you. And Adi Kochiyama Holman is the Director of Alumni Rate Relations for Advancing Justice, um, Asian Law Caucus, as we know it. She is also co-director of the Yuri Kochiyama Archives Project and co-editor of Passing It On, a memoir by Yuri Kochiyama. And for the past 21 years, Adi has served on the board of Eastside Arts Alliance in Oakland. So it's just really wonderful that um, you guys can work so closely together and, you know, archive and um, kind of keep Yuri's um, spirit and teachings alive um, and with us. Uh, so, so needed now. Um, I have some questions that I've prepared and I thought that our audience, our JC audience would really be interested in the family story and a little background. Um, and I remembered when I was doing some um, research in San Pedro, some of the old timers were saying, do you, you know, do I know Mary Nakahara? And then they would start laughing. I go, oh no, I don't think so. And they said, yes, you do. <laughs> so um, yeah, they knew her before she became famous we know as Yuri Kochiyama and quite the um, speaker. And um, so I was wondering, um, Adi, if you could tell us a little bit about your mom's pre-war kind of um, experience. Yeah, I just want to first thank you, Jill and Kathy, for inviting me to Kimmy to uh, JSA's uh, movie night. And JSA is an organization I love to support. and. So, and then I just want to mention in 1999, when my mom moved to the Bay Area and stayed with me and my husband and her for a little bit, um, I did contact JSA. We needed some help, uh, like social worker help. And somebody came to the house, I think, about twice to do visits. So, you know, I always remember that. So, thank you. Um, I just want to, so with my mom, she, as you know, she grew up in San Pedro, which is a small town in Southern California near LA. And she was, as you said, she was known as Mary Nakahara. She had a twin brother, Peter, and an older brother named Art. And her parents were born in Japan, uh, Issei, who moved to the U.S. as a young married couple. And they lived a very middle-class life and could be considered privileged at that time. Her father, you know, owned a fishing business in town. And so Yuri is a high school student. She attended San Pedro High School and she was the first girl in school history to be elected student body vice president. And she was also the first and maybe the only girl who, to receive a boys varsity letter for sports. So she was like the quintessential cheerleader, not like not a cheerleader, you know, dancing, but she was always the most supportive person in the school around sports, which she loved. So everything from tennis to basketball to um, football. And so when for every game they had a, she was always sat seated in the front on the bench because she brought her, her camera and her notebook. And she wrote for the school newspaper and for the San people Pedro News Pilot, which was the local paper, and they even gave her her own column, sports column, which she loved and mm -hmm. was so honored. So people in San Pedro remember my mom with her bicycle and that she would, even though she also had a car and she could drive, she often uh, just got her camera and her notepad and she got on her bike and she would uh, bicycle for hours to get to a game. And, or a tennis match. And so then there are times I just spoke to my cousin and he was saying that his dad used to complain that my mom's occasionally the bicycle would break down and she would have to, I don't know how she 
call them, but they would have to come pick her up and they were mad at her for that. Um, so she, she was someone who um, had amazing school spirit and was always so enthused with everyone about sports and everything. And she would even write letters to her classmates who were on teams just to build their morale and get them all excited about the game. And so actually my mom's love of sports didn't end in high school. Uh, when she was in the concentration camp, she was there to support the team. And then when she moved to New York, uh, especially in the 70s, 80s, uh, there was Japanese American uh, and a mixed team of uh, playing softball, my, my brother, my father, friends. And she would always write uh, like a, uh, a regular column in the Japanese American newspaper in New York to, uh, you know, talk about the games. So we're just going back to San Pedro, the, the idyllic life that she lived up until that time in high school. Uh, it changed dramatically on December 7th, 1941, when with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And her dad was unjustly arrested and taken to a prison hospital. He had just I think gotten over surgery, so he was not feeling well. And they put him in a hospital ward where there was a sign over his bed that said prisoner of war. And there were um, military people, Americans coming who were injured, who were put in that same ward. And when they saw that sign, they taunted him. And so he had, it was a really difficult time. He was there for several weeks. By the time, they released him and let him go home. He couldn't even recognize anyone in the family and he died the next day. So then shortly after, like other Japanese Americans in California, my mom, her brother went, were sent to a concentration camp in Jerome, Arkansas. So even though my mother's circle of friends and admirers in San Pedro are for the most part, more a lot more conservative than her. They really loved her. And when she would come to visit San Pedro, there was often these really big events, uh, whether it was a, a, a huge picnic in the park and a whole program, or they or they do a dinner party for her at a restaurant. So there was always that connection to the person they knew as Mary Nakahara. So I, I wanted to read an excerpt from a poem that my mother wrote when she was 18, and that was before the war. And it reflects her values that she had then and it went through the rest of her life. It's called My Creed. What type of person I, I was, am, or become, or whatever think, what others think of me, I hope to live by this one creed that which not I alone, but all others I have come in contact with formulated for me. I say others because I am only a part of all I have met. The creed is this, to live a life without losing faith in God, my fellow men and my country, to never sever the ties between any institution or organization that I have been a small part to never break one link of friendship, regardless of the time or distance that separates me from that friend, even if that friendship is only a memory stored away in my heart and mind. To never humiliate or look down on any other person, group, creed, religion, nationality, race, employment, or station in life, but rather to- Okay, sorry about that, Mom. Well, her creed goes longer. I think this excerpt is a testament to life she went on to live. Yeah, thank you for sharing that creed. I think we're having some. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay. okay. Um, I think we're okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
really it foretells um, her commitment at such an early age, um, Yuri's commitment um, for a just world, right? And she really had a vision. Um, and I, I met her personally just when she moved to the Bay Area more through through you and Eddie and you know kind of through the arts and um, she was um, not as active. She still was doing speaking engagements and always quite powerful. But I just remember she had that quality of really connecting with people and she got introduced, like really wanting to know your name and you know how how you were a part of or who you knew and. Um, and I know she connected so powerfully with people through her letter writing. And you were talking about writing letters to the people on the sports team. And I remember there was um, some Nisei uh, soldiers writing to Nisei soldiers and then later to supporting political prisoners. And can you talk a little bit about that really um, compassionate heart she had and really ways of connecting one-on-one -on -one with people? Oh, Adi, your um... My mom was an amazing uh, letter writer and note taker. And um, from her youth through her old age and every person she met, um, she would record their name, their address, their phone number, every letter she received, every letter she sent out. We, me and Akemi have notebooks of all her notes. And when she, during the war, um, when she was working at the USO in Camp Shelby, Mississippi, all the Japanese American uh, soldiers who came in, she had long lists of their names and their rank and everything. And that's why she was able to do the letter writing afterwards. But um, so she, after meeting my father at the USO gathering in uh, Mississippi during the war, my mother fell in love with him. and she started to write to him three times a day and he was in Europe. And so he would say, you know, I really appreciate the letters. I get so many. And sometimes he didn't get them, you know, right away. Of course, uh, it would pile up. And he felt bad that the other soldiers didn't get letters. Some of them didn't get letters. Some just got a few. So he said he knew she was teaching Sunday school at the camps and said, do you think maybe your Sunday school class could send letters to, to the other guys. So she uh, she organized the young girls, I think they were like high school age maybe, and they called themselves the Crusaders. And they would write hundreds of letters, hundreds, hundreds of letters to the uh, 442. And so over the years after the war, uh, when my parents, maybe two or three times they went to Hawaii, um, a lot of the Hawaii guys uh, remembered that and they would always honor my mom and just remember that she helped uh, build their morale during the war. Mm -hmm. So there was that. And then after um, the war, was like her correspondence was to her San Pedro friend, to family, civil rights activists, students that she met when she was speaking, and many others in her huge circle. And then for the family and a lot of close friends, she actually never missed a family member or a close friend's birthday, and even every single holiday, including, you know, like Valentine's Day, she'd send us cards. And the cards would be a personal note, as well as she's, she's a good artist. She would make a, you know, like a little drawing or put something funny in it or something. So there was always that. And then starting in the 1960s, when she became involved with the struggle for political prisoners, um, many of whom were, were unjustly incarcerated for their political beliefs and activism, she started to write letters, thousands upon thousands of letters. And this went on from the 60s to uh, she was in her late 80s, you know, still writing to people. And so in the archives that we have at Columbia University that Kemi and I are working on, there are some of those letters there. But, um, but she felt strongly that it was important that if someone is in prison, that you show support, you build morale, you learn about their cases, and then you advocate for them and you teach others. I mean, I think there are people like June Hamamoto, who's part of this group, that are uh, and other activists at the Asian Law Caucus and Asian Prisoner Support Committee who have 
who are carrying on that tradition, whether it's letter writing or visiting people in prison. And so that was my mom's way of reaching out. And so the other thing she did, she and my dad, was that um, from the time we were little kids, they had a Christmas newsletter called the Christmas Cheer for many years. And every Christmas, they had a huge list of hundreds of friends. We, each of us kids had to write uh, a column. We had to, they had a theme because my dad was in public relations. So, and he was an artist also. And so they would lay out this about an eight page uh, newsletter. But, and that went on for years. And then at one point when she became more politicized, uh, they changed here to, from a family and, you know, just, you know, activities and but important stuff. But they changed it to a political newsletter called the North Star. And at that point, she lost some of her uh, Sam she joined other friends who could not relate to that. But it was an important way for her to communicate uh, our family's politics, what she believed strongly, and of course Malcolm X played a big role in a lot of those issues, but it was something she and my dad and the family did for many years. So I think that was sort of going from the, you know, the letters during the war to her political activism. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Akemi, I'd love to um, draw you in a little bit. Um, I know that um, your grandfather, well, I learned that your grandfather was originally from New York, came to California, and then, you know, raised his family in New York. So he was true and through and through a New Yorker. And you were a lot of, um, a big part of the, in the core of the family. And I thought maybe you could share a little uh, remembrance about, you know, what it was like um, growing up in, um, kind of amidst the Kochiyama hub. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was, it was amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't think I knew how unusual it was until later, you know, until I grew up and I realized like, oh, you know, I, you know, I thought that this is how everybody's grandparents were. Um, but I think, uh, I think getting to watch them so closely, I spent a lot of time with them. My mom was working a lot. Um, Audie was working a lot. So uh, Audie's sons, my cousins, Lulu and I spent a lot of time um, in Bill and Yuri's household, you know, from the time we were born. Um, and I think watching them host so many uh, visitors and meetings and events, uh, both social and political, they weren't always political, um, watching uh, them host all these people in their home with such openness, I think, and grace and generosity, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, um, my whole life uh, deeply impacted me. Um, I think it was really fun. It was always exciting. There was always people there in their home. You never knew who you would encounter. Um, and I think you were always expected to just um, be helpful and jump in. You know, as a family member, I, I always joke that, you know, you were sort of like part of the staff in the house, you know, once you could walk, you know, or talk, you had to, you know, help, you had to cook or take coats or talk to people, make conversation. Um, they had an open house Saturday night party for a couple of decades. Um, that Saturday night, literally anyone in New York City could come to their house and lots of people came. Um, and I got to see like maybe the last 10 years of that. Um, I was born in 71, so I saw the last 10 years or so. And, and it was an incredible thing, I think. Um, and I think that, you know, the the openness of it I think and the and the way that they were very trusting I think of people and that it wasn't just it didn't it wasn't always serious you know there was a lot of like birthday celebrations and you know anniversaries and weddings and you know you know happy things um, that people were celebrating and I think I learned from them that um, social movements are really social you know um, you're a lot you know you're getting to know people in a lot of ways so I think um, that was just a really fun, incredible experience to have. I think also um, watching uh, Yuri engage with so many different kinds of people in the community, um, in, uh, in, in different kinds of movements. Um, in Harlem, you know, you'd see her just walking down 125th Street and she'd encounter so many people in who she knew from neighborhood things or different organizations. Um, and then, you know, throughout New York City, anywhere you would go with her to any political event, she would know so many people and be involved 
Um, and I and I and I was very luck lucky to have the opportunity to sort of tag along with her um, from the time I was little when she was babysitting me um, to later when I was chaperoning shown uh, I was chaperoning her when she was on the uh, college speaking circuit, which you know when I was in my twenties. <laughs> so that was really fascinating to have that long you know experience with her. Um, and I think and it really enabled me to see, you know, how she interacted and lived her, her values every day. Um, she was authentically uh, interested in and, and had a high level of respect for every person she met and everybody, whether that was like a cab driver or someone we encountered in the airport or, you know, a young student, um, you know, she was so interested in young people. Um, as Audie said, it amazed me when we were on the college uh, speaking circuit, every single student she met, she would take their information and correspond with them. And I have had the fortune of meeting a lot of those students again in my life since then. And they'll tell me like, oh, I met your grandma at this college or this, she came to my class and she wrote to me and this is why I do this or, you know. And so it's incredible to see that, like that impact and her ability to sort of organize all of that information, I think was also, uh, pretty had a profound interest uh, impact on me I think watching all of that um so yeah I just think I I think you know everything that you know you see in her work I think was reflected in her daily life and I think as her grandchild I think, think watching it was really impressive how consistent that was uh and I think just exemplary uh you know in terms of like how to how to be an open person you know and how to live your life I just want to go back to your question about my dad, Bill. Sure. Um, you know, he was born in 1921, the same year as Yuri in Washington, D.C., and shortly after his family moved to New York City. And he had a really complicated family history because his parents divorced or separated when he, maybe he was five or six. And he was told that his mother died. And that's what he believed from his father all his life. And she actually did not die at that time. She had, I guess they divorced and she left New York, went back to Japan, remarried and had a whole nother family and he never saw her again. So then by the time he was, you know, then meantime, two of his siblings, siblings died of illness too, when at a young age. So the only job my grandfather, Yutaka Kochiyama could get at that time, even though he was a very, um, you know, intelligent man who wanted to become a doctor, but there was no way at that time in America. So he became a domestic for a rich white family in the Hamptons in New York. So he had to put my father into what they used to, be. my father would refer to it as a half orphanage home. And these are kids who had one parent. And so, but he had to live there. It was called sheltering in arms. And it actually happened to be one block away from the public housing that we eventually moved to at Harlem in 1960. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he was the only non-white, uh, all the other kids were white kids who were living there, even though it was in Harlem at this time, it was different. And so he just saw his father once a week, like on Tuesday or something. And so that's how he grew up. And I think that's why he loved my mom so much that she was so family oriented and wanted to be around people. And he was around a lot of people. There were a lot of kids. He calls them his brothers and sisters, but he didn't have his own family, you know, growing up. So then in 1940, he came out to Northern California thinking he, he was already had finished college. But he, he told his dad he was going to go to UC Berkeley, which he did it. And he ended up in Oakland working in a laundry or something. And then, um, for, then, you know, when the war broke out, he ended up in Tampa and Assembly Center and then got sent to uh, Topaz concentration camp in Utah. And so while he was in the camp, he ended up uh, volunteering for the 442, you know, the uh, Japanese American combat team and was sent to Europe. And so, um, you know, after meeting my mom in Mississippi and, uh, you know, their correspondence, by the time before the war ended, they decided to get married and that he would go, she would meet him in New York and that's what happened. And that became her home. So they lived in two housing projects and by 1960, we moved to Harlem. And 
and just ends up, you know, one block away from sheltering arms. But, you know, my dad was like a real true New Yorker until he died in uh, 1993. And that's the same year that Ria's film came out. And I mean, looking at it again, I felt like Ria and Pat Saunders really captured my parents and of course my mom um, in a way that is so still so relevant today. And it was really nice to watch it and to have those memories there and they, they had, did such great research and you know and interviews with both my family as well as my uh that you know other activists mm -hmm. thank you Adi. that's great um we'll see more of um yuri and some of bill in the film um and i want to get to that but um akemi before you have to sign off i wondered if you could kind of speak to the relevancy of the film and um, your grandmother's um, legacy today through, you know, um, um, you're working on the archive project and, you know, kind of have a vision of how we can continue to learn from that, glean from that. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that, the legacy project, and then also if, um, I guess my question to you is if Yuri were here today with such the division and dis <clears throat> going on, you know, what do you think um, she would say to us or she would share with us? So kind of those two things, if you could um, respond to that. Sure, I guess, I guess the two things I would say is about your first part about um, sort of, you know, the relevance of Yuri's work today, I think, um, I think what's it's just incredible how how uh, how relevant how more relevant it seems like it's become over the last twenty years. I guess that I've been working on her archive stuff. Um, I think uh, when we first started working on this, I think it was I started working on her memoir with her like in the late 90, 1990s, I think, and I just I don't think I ever could have imagined or she could have imagined. Um, how much, uh, how involved I would get and spend in, in terms of spending all this time documenting and organizing her work. But now I feel like I'm so glad we did that. And I'm so glad she wrote the memoir. I'm so glad we uh, captured interviews with her and with Bill while they were, I mean, they look so young to me um, in those in those videos and um, still so like, you know, able to speak so clearly about their thinking and, and everything and be very reflective. Um, so I think it's so uh, important that we have been documenting um, this important solidarity work and community work they've been doing. They did all these years ago. Um, there's such a you know a lack of information about this. Some people don't even know that there's a long history of BIPOC solidarity um, in the United States, and some people work very hard to make it not visible um, because it's empowering, right? Um, and um, it goes against, you know, the model minority myth and, you know, all the sort of myths that they would like us to believe um, about, you know, so the history of, of resilience and struggle and community building um, in this country. So I think that it's really, um, I think I'm really important and I'm really glad and, and more and more I think of archiving work, especially around people of color in this country around the incredible work that a lot of women did, uh, women in particular archiving, right? Yuri was an archivist herself and a, you know, a collector and, and thank goodness, right? Uh, because she collected so much of what happened at a time across many different movements. And now that's very valuable um, to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. So I feel like that in itself in uh, archiving and documentary work is, is uh, is activism um, and, and really critical um, in support of critical race theory, in support of ethnic studies, right? Which we're seeing is, is very much uh, at risk, right? At, at, at still now. So I think it's relevant in all those ways. I think what she would be telling us, what she would be saying now, I don't think any of this is surprising, you know, would be surprising to her. I think in the film, she's actually warning quite a bit about some of the things that we're seeing happen right now um, in terms of the racial, the the hatred and and the misunderstandings right and what can happen right when people really don't know each other um and i think in particular she would be telling asian americans um that we need to learn uh more about our own history um in the country 
and the history of other people of color in the United States. I think she would, she, she said that many times, she would definitely be saying that now. I think she would be saying that as Asian Americans, we need to be in solidarity with other people of color in this country, uh, in the United States and internationally. Um, I think she would be telling us to remember our humanity. Um, I think if Yuri was anything, she was a great human being and really cared about humanity. And I think she would be uh, telling us to treat everyone with respect and with love. Um, and, 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 you know, she used to say all the time, I mean, she said, build bridges, not walls. It was something that she said a lot. And I think it's incredible how, how important, uh, and, and, you know, that is in this moment. Um, and, and they're literally building many, many walls. Um, so I think, you know, she would be where, you know, saying so many of the things that she said before, I think they just resonate a lot more um, powerfully right now in this moment. Watch, the grass is growing. Watch, but don't make it obvious. Let your eyes roam casually, but watch. In any prison yard, you can see it growing in the cracks, in the crevices, between the steel and the concrete, out of the dead gray dust, the bravest blades of grass shoot up, bold and full of life. There are many community acts. It's that the movement is contagious and the people in it are the ones who pass on the spirit. And because of that, I mean, uh, it just, you know, makes you want to always be a part of it. I don't have a particular agenda, but um, I would love to hear from people in the audience what you thought. And also, um, if you have any personal stories to share, does, does, did anybody know Yuri or have the chance to meet her? Hi, I'm Libra Marishta. Um, uh, we met Yuri. My wife knows Yuri. I met Yuri, my son. She was one of those uh, young students in high school that. Uh, reached out. I think, Adi, I think you helped to set up, uh, arrange for Kyle to meet uh, Yuri. Um, she's known my uh, sister-in-law and brother in, uh, brother-in-law in New York City for a long time. But Yuri was uh, great with my son. He wrote a paper and she read the paper, loved the paper. And uh, he kind of kept in touch with her through the years. And, uh, and then I was uh, proud to be the president of Cal State East Bay. And actually, Yuri had been given an honorary doctorate by Cal State Hayward at that time and Cal State East Bay later. So it was really a great uh, thing. And I mean, this movie is, I had never seen it and, uh, but it is so um, vibrant and current in terms of the issues that are there. And uh, Malcolm X said it well uh, in terms of his comments about uh, what needed to continue on and how we needed to work together. So thank you. Thanks, that's great. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm struck, every time I see this, I'm struck by how forward thinking and how prescient Yuri was. Um, uh, and I, I, it's just amazing to me that, you know, 30 years later, this documentary came out in, I think, 1992 or 1993. And um, it's still, we still have things we can learn from it. It's just amazing. I'm also totally amazed at her level of energy. I mean... <laughs> I wish I could have uh, just even a, a fraction of the energy that she must have had. So um, I find her very inspiring today. So I'd love to hear from, uh, from others. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yes? Um, I'm Kazue Nakahara. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we were, my husband and I were on a pilgrimage to Tule Lake several years ago. And um, Yuri heard us talking, you know, about our names. And so she came up, she said, hi, I'm Mary Nakahara. 
And we went, oh, nice to meet you. It's, you know, yeah, we're Nakahars or, you know, not local. And uh, my husband's from Japan. Anyway, so um, we had no idea who this nice grandmotherly lady was until we got to Tule Lake and the, the pilgrimage. We saw her walking up on the stage and all of a sudden she was Yuri Kochiyama. So, oh my goodness. We had absolutely no idea what a <laughs> oh, civil rights activist she was because she was just so nice and grandmotherly when she introduced. And anyway, we, we were so pleased that she introduced herself to us and we can say we actually met this woman. So anyway. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank that's, you. That's a terrific <laughs> memory. Thank you so much. Jeez. I'm sure do other people have any um, personal recollections like that? Love to hear it. I have one. Yes. <laughs> Pam, go ahead. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Audie. Um, I first met Audie Oh my goodness. This was the early 1980s. Um, I was in New York and met her because of Sodaiko. And mm -hmm. I ended up staying at Audie's apartment. Um, gee, was it a week or so? Can't remember. And um, her parents invited me over. So I had dinner over there, met her parents. And that was, I guess, the start of one of my more inspiring visits and getting to know um, the Kochiyamas. And um, ever since then, you know, I, I mean, I, another big plus is that, yes, Yuri never forgot anybody. So when she moved to Oakland and I was able to visit her at Audie's place, she looked at me, she goes, oh, I know who you are. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, she remembers me. Um, and that's the kind of person that Yuri was, and it was wonderful. It was wonderful to know her. Thanks. Pam, were you able to have some conversations with her? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, she was, you know, and she was always a fighter, and she was always standing up for the right issues, and um, what she was doing back then is so relevant to today because we haven't really moved forward that much we're addressing the same issues again, over and over. Um, and I wish that people could learn from what she went through and um, it'd be great if, I don't know if her book is still available. I have her book, Passing It On, um, right here. <laughs> um, and it'd be great if people could read it and learn from it. And I don't know if it's still, you know, being published, so. Oh, if Akemi is here, she could probably tell us more about that. Um, I hope it is still in print. Yeah, I think it is. Uh, UCLA um, uh, Asian American Studies Department published it, and um, I'm pretty sure they did a re it did the original the initial print sold out, and then they did another another run. So I think it still exists. Great, thank you. Um, also, I, I guess I should do a shout out. Um, a book that I have was written by Diane Fugino uh, called Heartbeat of Struggle. Um, and that I was rifling through it and I noticed that it has that cartoon of Yuri on the bicycle when she was in high school. So that was a nice, um, that was a nice memory that Rhea, I think, pointed out. So, thank you. Do we have others who want to, to contribute? Can you see me? Hi, I am Junko Kemotsu. Uh, well, uh, I remember uh, Yuri Kochema fondly that uh, I was very lucky that I had so many uh, great occasions that to be able to see her and talk to her and then uh, uh, been a company at the family party. And uh, so one of my uh, uh, stand, uh, good memories of her is that when I took Yuri to uh, my uh, social work graduate uh, uh, 
that was a wonderful event. And then I asked Yuri to, can you come speak to social workers of my cohorts? And uh, that was uh, uh, one of the day that, uh, uh, that my entire uh, social workers was, uh, was there and then we got together and then uh, be able to talk about the issues and then and the current and then yes and then we invited other speakers and then Yuri was one of them and I was so proud that I was able to bring her and speak yes she spoke about the anti-war and then I remember that uh, my cohort uh, gave a standing ovation to Yuri <laughs> so that was when she was in her 80s and the late 80s that she was already using a walker but the, her speech was very strong that i remember so that was a very fond memory of yuri thank you thank you for sharing yeah welcome uh, um so i want to invite um anyone else who wants to speak not only if you had a personal um a relationship with Yuri, but also just what did you think of, of watching this documentary? What are your thoughts about um, what we've been able to to learn and share tonight? I would love to to hear people's thoughts about about that in relationship to what's going on today. I'd also like to invite anyone who's involved in any current um, activity um, who wants to share with us um, or you know inform us of things that are going on that may be uh, ways that we can be involved and more active as citizens. I guess I just want to share, I mean, maybe some people on this call know about this already, but, um, you know, Sudo for Solidarity um, is an organization um, that's doing really good uh, work, um, was uh, sort of formed after Donald Trump became president and the Muslim ban happened, I think, in 2016. Um, and uh, this organization uh, organized in response to that and then has gotten much more involved in uh, supporting immigrants in detention centers at the borders um, and more recently really involved in mobilizing a national education program for the Japanese American community to get more educated around reparations for black people and why um, Japanese Americans should be supporting HR 40, which is right now, you know, a, a bill on the table for uh, looking at reparations, studying reparations for black people. Um, and actually they've been really successful in mobilizing national support um, from the Japanese American community and Japanese Americans actually testified in the HR 40 um, hearings that, that took place a couple of months ago. So I think that's one really good organization. Um, also JAS, um, Japanese Americans for Justice, I think that organization is also doing a lot of really good work. So I think that, you know, there are, there are organizations who are doing good stuff. And uh, Sudo for Solidarity has like, uh, you know, sort of abolition, they've created a virtual, like a abolition, uh, virtual education sort of uh, uh, platforms. Um, and there's there's many resources available. So if you just look them up online, they have a website and they have an um, Instagram platform as well. There's a lot of useful content and ways to. Uh, they have a reading club. They have a book club on on Black and Japanese reparations. Um, they've been engaging uh, uh, Japanese American for Justice uh, engaged with Tanahasi Coates to come talk about reparations. Um, so there's been a lot of really good work um, from some of those organizations. And there's more, I'm sure, that other people on this call are aware of. But I just wanted to, to also shout them out because it's really important what they're doing. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Tsuru for Solidarity has been doing some great work. And um, so I'm happy to give a shout out to them. Um, I think many of us are on their mailing lists. But if you're not, I encourage you to, um, to get signed up so that you can hear about what, what they're doing and what they're working on. Um, Thank you. I want to read one thing uh, in the chat from Amy Mass, um, Amy Iwasaki Mass. She writes, hi, Audie. I've known how remarkable your mom has been for many years, since her years in Hart, um, but the, oh, in Harlem. But the full story in Rhea and Pat Sanders, Saunders' film was a wonderful reminder about what a remarkable, great human being she was. I was honored to have her over for lunch in one of her last years back in the Bay Area. Thank you, Amy, for sharing that. Um, is there anyone 
else? Um, oh, you know, I have to correct myself. I said that the uh, the cartoon about um, Yuri on the bicycle, I said that was a, a Rhea story, but I believe that was Audie's story, talking about her mom growing up. Um, and also, uh, just want to mention that um, HR 40 has been on the books for, or not on the books, but has been on the table for many years. But I think um, we're seeing more motivation for it now than before. Uh, the late, great John Conyers introduced it. And so I'm very happy to see that it's gaining new life and momentum. Um, hope we can see that through soon this year. Okay, are there other, um, oh, Grace, do you want to say something? Do you want to unmute yourself? Oh. Hi, everybody. Hi, um, I just wanted to share that I met Yuri when she moved to Oakland. Um, Yang Li invited me to be part of this group, a small group of Asian American women who were activists. It was kind of a support group for us, you know, to talk about what it meant to be an Asian woman and to learn to speak out and everything. So um, there was Ying and Ish Ish, Jean Ishimoto, Ishi. Ishi, oh, Ishibashi, um, Betty, Kano, um, let's see, Kiku Funabiki. And um, what we did is we get together once a month and we meet in the bottom of the, the first we met in J-Town, but that just became hard to meet there in J-Town. So then we started meeting in the library San Francisco library basement and we'd bring treats and just talk and talk about what it meant to be together. And I think it was around that time that Judy was also volunteering for the Aaron Watata committee when people were working to support him when he took his stand about going to um, Iraq. So I felt really lucky to be part of this group and just hang out with these great um, odor activists, the pioneers, I would say, for all of us. Thank you, Grace. That's great. That's a great memory. Thank you. Would anyone else like to, to say a few words? <clears throat> Kathy, this is Karen. Um, are we, I know you're recording this. Is there some way that this will be available for, for reviewing? future viewing uh yeah i think we usually and end up uh, it goes a little bit through a bit a bit of editing and then it gets usually posted up to the um jsa youtube channel right jill right that's correct mm -hmm. so give us a few days or a week or so to to get it ready and then um it'll be up there and so you can you can watch it again um and maybe um i know i will because <laughs> there was a lot of info in tonight's program. So I'm gonna have to revisit it and uh, remember some of the things that people said. This was a really special evening, so. And there were a lot of people that I was thinking about as I was watching it and I wished I could, you know, I, I wanted to be able to share it. So if, if it's available that way, then that would be great. Thank you. Great, thanks, Karen. Uh, I don't know, it's so great to have a combination of good filmmaking, but also something that's socially um, worthy and just artistically innovative at the same time. It's a real treat. Um, I'm very Kathy, grateful. I just wanted to share before you jump off, I'm just gonna share a link with everyone in the chat right now. Um, I just realized, um, I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but speaking of films, uh -huh. Uh, Renee Tajima and Jeff Chang developed um, 14 uh, solidarity videos, like mini docs about the history of solidarity. One of them was about Yuri and Malcolm, but there's many others about other examples of, of particularly Black Asian solidarity, but other solidarity stories as well. Um, I just shared the link on that site. There's 14 different videos. They're all like two or three minutes. Um, and it's part of this program, this project they're calling the May 19th Project in honor of Yuri Malcolm's and Ho Chi Minh's uh, 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 shared birthday. 
Um, and so I just wanted to share that and, and get that out to people, especially if you're an educator or you know educators, a lot of people are looking for resources right now. And, and these videos are really good in just giving with, and then on the website, there's actually more educational resources as well. Oh, thank you so much. I, thanks for pointing that out. I remember hearing about these short videos and then I, I didn't know where to find them. So thank you. I hope everybody sees that in the, um, in the chat. If not, I will, I will make a point of copying all of these links down and then I'll send them in my next email to, to all of you as a reminder. Um, and also I wanna say that I came across on YouTube um, a 90 minute collection of conversations between Yuri and Angela Davis. And um, that is also tremendous. So uh, I highly recommend you looking for that on YouTube as well. And, and that's called Mountains That Take Wing. That's right. Uh, that documentary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other any other um, announcements? Otherwise, I will uh, let everybody go. Thank you again for hanging with us for the whole evening. And we'll see you again next time. So thanks and take care. Mm -hmm.